Hi, I'm John Shook, and I'm here to talk about the A3 management process. As uh, described in the new uh, Lean Enterprise Institute book, Managing uh, to Learn, uh, I'd like to begin by uh, asking a simple question, uh, simple but profound, I think, which is how do you want to lead and manage? Uh, I think many of us ask ourselves how we can lead, how we can manage to get better performance or to get the organization where we need it to go. But if you ever actually stop to think and ask yourself how you actually want to manage and work with your people, would you be uh, out on the front lines like uh, Alexander the Great leading things or sitting up on a hill watching things and having people come to you with ideas, uh, solutions, and proposals? How would you actually want that to look? How would they look if you could actually design it in the most ideal way? I think that's an important backdrop question to consider as we approach the A3 process. I'll make a, a, a hypothesis here of what I think managers do or should do, or lean managers anyway which is just two things. I'm going to boil it all down to two things at some risk of, of oversimplifying, but I really think this is it. That if managers can get each person to take initiative to solve problems and improve his or her own job, and ensure that each person's job is aligned to provide value for the customer and prosperity for the company, then we are fulfilling our role as a leader and a manager. Just those two things. Um, with that, I will, let's explore some different ways of kind of saying what I believe is the same, same thing, basically. This is an illustration that uh, we used to use when I worked for Toyota back in Toyota City 25 years ago. We used a lot of cartoons to do training because a picture can be worth a thousand words. And this one illustrates the old uh, uh, picture I think you've seen before of people doing Kaizen or continuous improvement, trying to climb a hill. And the person at the top has a flag, and they put that flag at the top of the hill at the pinnacle. And uh, the goal is accomplished, Kaizen, <coughs> Kaizen is achieved. This is slightly different. You'll notice the leader turned around. So it's a different sort of pull system. where You see the, the leader pulling the people up. They, you see sweat pouring off as they're trying to, to work and, and, and come along. What this is saying, that we need to get the job done, climb the hill, and develop our people. We need to do those at the same time. Here's another thing uh, that we can look at that I think says essentially the same thing, uh, which is going back to the beginning of the NUMI uh, joint venture between Toyota and General Motors uh, 25 years ago. That's what I entered in, into to, to Toyota, which is to work on this project. This photograph, as you can see, is from April 1984. And I'll draw your attention to the tall gentleman in the back with the mustache. That's Gary Convis, uh, who had just been hired from Ford uh, to be our plant manager. And uh, Gary had brought his uh, leadership management team with him to Toyota City to learn about the management process uh, to work in the Toyota production system. Uh, Gary had a boss, his name was uh, Kan Higashi, the senior Japanese there. So um, the way it works is that uh, every boss is a mentor, so Mr. Higashi was Gary's mentor. And uh, some early advice or coaching that, that uh, Mr. Higashi gave to Gary was uh, as follows. To lead the organization as if you have no power. Now, Gary did have power. He was the plant manager. But the words here are to lead as if you have no power. I think there's a, a, a lot of meaning there, a lot of wisdom there. To try to lead as if you have no power. To explore that a little bit further, uh, I did work in Toyota City for five years. Um, worked for the company for a total of 11 years, five there in the manufacturing arena. And almost never during that period was I told exactly what to do or how to do it. Almost never was I given a solution. Yet, I was not free to just do what I wanted. Now this gave me quite a conundrum as I tried to figure out what it meant. Uh, essentially, I was being coached and mentored with the same principle that uh, Gary Convis was, uh, as he was told to lead as if you have no power. But it took me a while to even realize this was happening. Three years into the company, I finally went to my boss one day and I said, I just noticed. I've been here three years and no one's ever given me a solution or told me exactly what to do. Um, yet I realized that I wasn't just free to do what I wanted. So I asked him how, how this works. What, 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 what does this mean? And he said to me something at that time that I've decided since then is a human truism. It has nothing to do with Toyota. It has nothing to do with the auto industry. It has nothing to do with Japan. He said, whenever you tell someone what to do, 
you take the responsibility for that action away from them. I think that has to be true. And if we recognize that, if we agree with that, that must change everything about the way we lead and manage people. Now, instead of that, what happened? What, what, the way this worked was I was given clear responsibility to propose countermeasures to problems that I own. So my boss, my mentor, was going to do everything he could not to tell me exactly what to do because he did not want to take away the responsibility of the ownership for those actions. I, however, was given the, the, the responsibility to propose countermeasures, which is what I would do. Now, the way this works, the dynamics of this, I'm going to suggest, are, constitute the heart of Toyota's way of managing. And what they do is provide extraordinary focus, direction, and control. Because the way it would work is I would have an idea. I, would, I was given a problem and, and, and asked, what are you going to do about this? What is your proposed solution? My first proposal, especially when I was had just gotten there, usually wasn't a very good one. I would come up with some idea, at which point I would be asked by my mentor, by my boss, why do you propose that? Of all the things you could do with your time, with the company's resources right now today, why is that the thing you propose? And that began the mentoring process. That then provides extraordinary focus, extraordinary direction, extraordinary control. At the same time, providing maximum flexibility. Because no one is telling anyone exactly what to do. Each person is free to pursue their entrepreneurial solutions to problems that they own. Now, I'm going to suggest now that that dynamic actually resolves the age-old dilemma of all large organizations. A large organization or any size organization has this dilemma, this clash, this tension between control versus flexibility. That means you can't have uh, everyone doing what they want, but you can't have one person telling everyone what to do when. So control versus flexibility, direction versus adaptability, this is the challenge that organizations have. And Toyota's way of working organically between managers and subordinates makes this dilemma melt away. The dilemma can be stated most simply in terms of you can't have one person telling 10,000 people what to do when. Neither can you have 10,000 people doing what they want when they want to. This way of working, this leadership, this management is as different from the commonly accepted notion of the enlightened modern manager as it is the old command and control dictator. Now everyone denigrates nowadays the command and control dictator. We say that doesn't work. And I would agree, uh, I would join in that course. But what has been offered as an alternative? And I'll suggest almost nothing. That the enlightened modern manager is usually a laissez-faire kind of management where we tell everyone, oh, you're empowered, now you can do what you want. I don't care how you do it, just achieve the results, and, uh, and it's up to you. The Toyota manager, as I'm describing, it never says, I don't care how you're going to do it, it's just up to you. I want to, care, I want to hear how you plan to do it, I need to hear your thinking, because my job is to develop you and raise you up to the next level. So it's a radically different way of working. It's neither of these two extremes, and it actually solves the dilemma that encumbers all large organizations. And it is the key, I believe, to Toyota's incredible success that it's had over the last 50 years. This slide shows where we all may lie on the continuum of uh, doing Kaizen, leading Kaizen in our organizations. You see the focus along the bottom, of doing a point kaizen, eliminating mood, eliminating waste, and on the other side doing system kaizen, which means eliminating the overburden, the mura, uh, muri, and the fluctuation, the variation, which is the mura. And we all reside somewhere along that left axis there, with front lines, middle management to senior management. We all then have different responsibilities accordingly, and we have different tools that can enable us to fulfill those. Uh, the bottom left-hand corner there, you see standardized work, which is great for eliminating waste. In the upper right-hand corner, you see SD, that means st uh, strategy deployment, uh, or Hushin Conry, which is great, uh, the, a way of achieving uh, uh, doing PDCA at that level of the organization. In the middle then, we see VSM, value stream mapping, and the A3. So this is how this tool can fit in with our management system. The A3 is just a paper size. The International 11 by 17. A3 planning began in the 1960s as the quality circle problem solving uh, format. So many of you have seen these before as you learned uh, PDCA, as you learned uh, TQM. At Toyota, though, it evolved to become the standard format for problem solving, for proposals, uh, for plans, and for status reviews, for any conversation that we wanted to have where we wanted to clarify our thinking to ourselves and to others. What's important is not the format, 
but the process and the thinking behind it. An A3 will lay out an entire plan, large or small, on one sheet of paper. I've seen uh, very large plans to create a subsidiary, to create a new factory on one, uh, one sheet of paper, uh, or, or very micro level uh, plans to solve the problem of, 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 uh, of breakdown on a certain machine, for example. It should be visual and extremely concise, and by being on one sheet of paper, it shouldn't just be visual and concise. It has to be. It has no choice. You have to filter through all the huge amounts of information that we have and focus on that that's only relevant to this situation. It should tell a story laid out from upper left hand side to lower right which anyone can understand. We used to write these and challenge ourselves to be able to, to take it home and be able to explain to a family member in 10 or 15 minutes even a very complex and involved a business problem. So the A3 process will make it easier for you to persuade others. And anyone in any level of management has the, has the problem, the challenge of persuading others. That's what we do as managers, is we try to bring each other, others along to our way of, of thinking. And we want to also understand others at the same time. We have, I'm sure everyone here has a situation every day where someone comes to you and they need something, they want something. Wouldn't it be great if we had a standard process by which we could actually understand what it really was that they needed and wanted uh, during those times? An A3 process then fosters dialogue in the organization by being a standard process, a standard tool that everyone knows. Everyone can take their A3 as currency. It's a currency of dialogue, of conversation within different aspects of, uh, of the organization. It will develop thinking problem solvers because as you put an A3 together, as you write it, you will find that you'll almost invariably, if the A3 is sitting here and you have your solution in the lower right hand corner, You'll want to start there. I know what I want to accomplish. You'll try to backfill the story to fit it. And you'll find that it just doesn't work. You'll become a much better problem solver through writing these. And I find that, I find that to be true today for me as well. It'll clarify the link between true problems and countermeasures, as opposed to having to, to, to decipher what, you know, what, 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 what's the logic that someone is bringing to me with their proposal. What disconnect might there be between, within the data that they're talking about? A disconnect a lack of a linkage between the pro problem and the countermeasure will jump off the page at you once you become accustomed to reading these A3s. The A3 process will encourage PDCA because it's built into the format and it's built into the overall pro process. Plan, do, check, and act. It'll encourage frontline initiative. This is an important factor because if we go back to those earlier dynamics that I think uh, in, in encompasses what lean leadership and management needs to be, we want everyone to exercise initiative. If that's the case, it becomes our responsibility to give people a tool, a process, and training by which we can do that. So that becomes a pretty dramatic uh, uh, proposal. The fact that we're actually training people on how to take initiative, instead of initiative being something that people are born with and that we encourage this just through promoting people to take initiative and not promoting people who don't. We're actually going to give people the skill to take initiative because I want everyone in the organization to be taking initiative to solve problems and make improvements. It also uh, gives us five S of information and that's an important and very nice convenience for us uh, in today's management. Certainly a huge problem everyone has is uh, information overload. And uh, since we can only put relevant information on this one single sheet of paper, and that's the initial insight, put that anything that's important that we want to be able to communicate can be done on one sheet of paper, we have to have five S of information. It'll serve then as an organizational learning tool. Uh, organizational learning means many things to many people, but in this case, with mentors working with mentees to, 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 to learn together, to see what the real facts of a situation are, to work through for proposals, it becomes a dynamic front lines way of achieving organizational learning. Finally, and this is the final uh, list, uh, fi final of, uh, example here of the benefits of the A3 process, it will indeed lead to effective countermeasures and solutions based on facts and data. Now, everyone wants good solutions based on facts and data. This will indeed, this process will indeed give us that. But notice that it comes in after all those other ancillary soft benefits, which I argue are equally important to the fact that it can help us give the mechanical solution and solve problems. So to kind of summarize, among other things, the A3 process structures effective and efficient dialogue so that people are actually talking to people, to each other, and understanding each other, which then gives us a shot, a prayer, at agreement. 
to engaging the hearts and minds of everyone in the organization. So here's an A3. Uh, this is one that we uh, use in the uh, book that we uh, just came out with, Managing to Learn. And this is a template. I always hesitate to give a template because it's so easy for this to become a hammer looking for a nail. But this one is structured around a set of questions. And any business discussion, in fact, revolves around a set of questions. This one begins with, what are you talking about? What's the theme? What's the conversational issue that we have facing us? The first box here of the seven boxes, and it may, in this, in this case, the template we provide is seven boxes. It may be that a certain situation would, would be better with five or with eight. Certainly, we would use it as a very flexible tool inside Toyota. But the background means, why are you talking about it? So what are you talking about? Why is it important? Or to state more formally, this means, uh, what's the business context? From a business standpoint, what's the business case of why that we should be concerning ourselves with this issue? From there, we move to current conditions. Where before we can talk about where we want to go, we need to understand where we stand, where are things today, and make a statement of the problem. What is the problem that's facing us? From there, we can develop goals and targets. We want to make those very specific and measurable if possible. And then the analysis. And uh, one of the things I like about this tool is it can be so flexible. So you can plug in any problem analysis tool that your organization may use, whether it's Six Sigma, whether it's the old seven QC tools, whether it's uh, Kepner Trago or Shannon, you can plug any of those problem analysis tools right here in this box. The A3 then provides you with the means of giving a business context to the, to the story. Then we can have our proposed countermeasures, uh, not just one, some alternatives, and then an agreed upon way that we will decide amongst those alternatives. And then the plan, uh, usually something that looks like a Gantt chart, uh, another fine management tool, uh, where we'll show over time who's going to do what, by when, uh, with responsibilities uh, clearly, uh, clearly laid out, who, what, when, where, and why, in the plan. And then the follow-up, where we'll ask ourselves not only what may be left out and not solved by this particular proposal, but what additional problems may, be, may, be, may arise from the activities that we'll undertake through putting this plan in, in place. So uh, in the book that we, uh, that we uh, are managing to learn, we have uh, two protagonists in the book. There's a learner and a teacher, a mentee and a mentor. And it was very important to us, very important to me, to be able to show both of those stories. So we have two running storylines, two columns running through the length of the book, where we show the young learner, whose name is Desi Porter, who's working through a, a serious problem, an assignment he's just been given, and his boss, Ken Sanderson, who has the challenge of mentoring his young charge through working through this issue, identifying the problem, coming up with solutions, and putting that in place. So learning to write an A3 is not the challenge. You can learn to do that in a day. It's how to write a, uh, lay out a problem, problem solving, a proposal, on one sheet of paper. There's nothing unique in that. That sort of idea has been around for a long time. But if we can use it as a way to encourage dialogue in the organization, then we can come to embody the kind of behavior that we began talking about in the very beginning. So what you see here is the mentee's first A3, which has a lot of problems. What's happened is he has jumped to a solution. He's decided that he knows what to do, and he's filled out his nice A3. He now owns the solution. He felt very proud. What this enabled his boss, Sanderson, to do was to look at that and therefore understand his thinking, understand Porter's thinking to be able to start asking questions around that. So he knew, Sanderson knew, what his challenge was in terms of mentoring Porter to another level. So what happens is the mentee is coached to go back and now try to start telling his story, first of all, visually. Make sure he captures what the real situation is, not just making assumptions, but go to the Gimba and find out. And we're going to use this A3 as a way to prevent ourselves from jumping ahead. All of us, because we're in such a rush every day to solve so many problems, of course we want to jump ahead. So forcing ourselves to stop and work through a problem-solving situation becomes absolutely key, and having a process such as the A3 can help us do that. So what you can see in the second A3 is the, the subsequent boxes aren't even filled out. So Sanderson is able to say to Porter, I'm not even going to talk to you about the solution, even about the countermeasures even about the detailed analysis until you've shown that you've actually gone to the Gimba and find out what's happening. So this enables the mentor to be able to teach the mentee a way of approaching problems. And this is the old uh, uh, lean problem-solving funnel that many of you may have seen before. 
where we understand the perception of the presenting problem, uh, clarify that, grasp the situation. So we're still not even as we're grasping the situation going to five whys. We want to go understand the, work, the way the work is done to do the problem breakdown. And even there, as we go to the Gemba to do the problem breakdown, we're not actually even jumping to five whys yet, much less to the root cause, much less to the countermeasure. We're going to force ourselves to go through this systematically using management by science. And so in the case of uh, Porter in the book, he's able to then take this generic, this learning, and apply it to the specific problem he's working on, which is that he has a lot of documents that need to be translated from Japanese to English. And as he works through that issue, he finds that it causes many, many problems throughout the organization and is in fact going to impede the, the possible the successful launch of the doubling of capacity that's required for this organization. This then is his final A3. So in this case, we see a complete story. He has clarified the current situation, which is the, uh, which is the company needs to go from 250,000 to 500,000 uh, units. Uh, that's going to require a lot of documents that need to be translated. And the tsunami of documents that are going to come to the translators are going to cause many problems and delays that will affect the loss. This has been the company's experience in the past. So Porter goes out, he looks at the current conditions, he draws a current state map so he knows how the current situation works, the current system works. He develops some goals, some targets, uh, zero defects at launch, rework less than 10%, uh, delivery 100% on time, uh, cost decrease of 10% in his first day three, focused only on cost and a very specific way of achieving that without knowing what the real problems were, which through his analysis, analysis he's identified what the group causes are which now he's uh, grouped in three buckets. Uh, documents are getting lost for a certain set of reasons, and then there are translation problems even when they aren't getting lost uh, for another set of reasons. From there he goes to some proposed countermeasures that are linked specifically to those root causes that he's identified. So for the readers of this A3, as he took it through the organization, they could easily ask questions and ask why he was proposing certain things. He's, out, he's also then shown that proposal very visually with his, with his uh, with his uh, map, his, his the future state map, then he has a very clear plan with a Gantt chart of who's going to do what, by when, who's responsible, how they're actually going to do their review as they put it in place, and his follow-up, how he's going to work to ensure that it moves ahead. So that's the A3, and again, we can learn how to write an A3 uh, that would be probably uh, workable or passable here today. But what's important is how Porter, with the coaching of Sanderson, used it in the organization to inhibit, to, to exhibit this behavior, which is pull-based authority. Whether Porter was at the top of this little pyramid in the middle or at the bottom, he's developing proposals, taking it up to the person above him, and, coming and, and then getting authorization accordingly. You see the arrows going sideways as well. What's happening is we can use the A3 as almost a combine to manufacture the authorization we need to take forth to the organization ideas which we entrepreneurially own. This is the essential key, I think, to what makes lean management so powerful. Remember my experience, as I discussed before. In my five years at Toyota City, I almost never was I told what to do, but I wasn't free to do just what I wanted. And, and also remember the two responsibilities of a lean leader and of leading as if you have no power. That means getting the job done and developing your people and doing those two things at the same time. Remembering those dynamics, and remembering the way Porter used pull-based authority to manufacture his own authorization, we can start to analyze the notion of what get the job done means. What does it require? Getting the job done requires solving real business problems and making improvements in the way work is performed at every level of the company, from CEO to frontline worker. In each activity of the company, from, front, from manufacturing to engineering to sales, in real time, not looking at the figures at the end of the month, but actually working in real time and at the root cause, which means understanding what a root cause analysis even is. Develop people then means providing them with the skills to solve those real business problems and making improvements in the way they perform their own work. So the way the A3 fits in all this is we can ask ourselves if we have a process or structure to help us to solve problems, to help us gain the agreement that we need and a process in place to actually help us lead and mentor people that can provide a basis upon which we can ask questions, 
and develop thinking ability. The answer to that in many cases I think leads us to, to, to question this and to realize the fact that first of all it's more important to provide the right question than it is to provide the right answer. The A3 process provides a standard structure which we can use to ask good questions. If you are uh, Mr. Cho, the current chairman of Toyota, or if you are Socrates, you might be a genius uh, at asking questions in a vacuum without having a clear process to help you do it better. I can't do that. It helps for me to be able to have this process in place. And if we want everyone managing and working in this way, everyone, not just the ones who are born with this skill, then it's going to make sense for us to have a process in place. That then becomes a process also to help us exercise lean management. My hypothesis to you right now is that there's a bell curve in this room, but that you are not actually doing this. Some of you with that bell curve are coming closer than others. Uh, most of us somewhere in the middle. Some of us not even close. Some of us not even wanting to manage it this way. But I'm suggesting that you are not actually managing it this way. And as I spoke those words, I'm betting that many of you uh, nodded in agreement. Uh, some of you physically, perhaps, but if not, at least in your mind. But what you were thinking of, you were thinking about others in the room, or others in your organization, that they aren't managing in this way. But actually, I'm talking about you. I'm talking about us and how we can develop ourselves to be better as leaders and managers and actually leading as if we have no power to get each person to take initiative, to solve problems in the way they do their work, and then to align that work so it's accomplishing our aims of prosperity for the company and satisfaction for the customer. To do that, having a good system in place, a good process is going to help us, and that's where the A3 can fit in. Uh, good luck to you as you work through exploring these issues the rest of the day and as you go back to work. Thank you.